I would uh, interact with you on chat and introduce all that are in the room. But, of course, we've done this a little bit differently. If you're one of our uh, first-timers, welcome to Bible study tonight as we are uh, going to uh, look at a number of things in the book of Colossians. I hope you'll enjoy it. Again, uh, no chat opportunities tonight because we are um, uh, pre-recorded in a sense, uh, but I uh, am excited nonetheless to get into Bible study and to uh, participate and uh, good looks like uh, the comment box is coming in that uh, we're good so i am glad and so with that welcome to bible study here in our third session of the book of colossians i hope you have your bible and you'll take it and you will follow along and uh, you've also got on the live stream page the notes that are available uh, for session three and uh, this uh, particular session is going to be uh, verses 9 through 13. We actually finished last time in verse 9. I want to pick up just a little bit of what we said and then carry forward because verse 9 really was not a, a, a good stopping point. So I got to refresh just a little bit as we come into Bible study tonight. I tell you what, I'd like us to, to uh, go to our, uh, our scripture tonight in the Lagos Bible software and uh, begin to look at that. Glad to have uh, um, our, uh, our, our uh, video tech, Jeremiah Sutton, is with us uh, today, and I appreciate that. He'll help us uh, through the way. And uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. I've got the King James Version and uh, the Greek that we'll use just a little bit of perhaps today, and then you can follow along if you would like in the Young's Literal Translation. But uh, as uh, we consider this, again, what we picked up last time in the goal that Paul has. He says, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard of it, that is your love for all the saints, we do not cease to pray for you and desire that ye be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, this is the key right here the knowledge of his will. It is God's, it is Paul's desire that the Colossians, and I'm convinced uh, me and you, would have the knowledge of his will. Knowledge here is the word epigenosis. Gnosis is the word uh, from which we actually get the word knowledge. In fact, uh, uh, in the Greek, it has a silent G. In the English, it has a silent K. And no or gno, uh, from gnosis, they come together. But epigenosis is really a bond knowledge. This is a, a very practical kind of knowledge that you get when you've worked at something. So he wants uh, the Colossians and us to work to have the knowledge of his will and to have that knowledge in wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, I uh, mentioned last week, and so I won't spend much time on it, but a knowledge of the Bible is the easiest thing to come up with. A knowledge of his will is more challenging because that requires not only knowing what the Bible says, but then uh, putting all that together and interpreting it and discerning it for what is God's will or God's plan for the ages. And then the hardest part is doing that in wisdom and spiritual understanding. So, you can be, uh, shall I say, dumb as a box of rocks and still have a working knowledge of the Bible. But that, uh, that, that kind of knowledge where you would uh, maybe do well in a Bible trivia game is no good if it hasn't been worked together to be not only a knowledge of the Bible, but a knowledge of his will, and then to have wisdom and spiritual understanding that goes with that. And, of course, that is going to require uh, the Holy Spirit uh, to... Uh, to, to, to be there. Now, here's what I want to focus on before we get into verse 10. The knowledge of his will. His will, notice it doesn't say the knowledge of his will for your life. Wouldn't you like to have that? Everybody would like to uh, have that. If I could buy a book or uh, pr print a formula that would share the knowledge of God's will for your life, you would buy the book, wouldn't you? It uh, wouldn't matter if you're 75 years old or 750 years old or uh, seven and a half years old. You'd say, I want to know what God's will for my life, my marriage, my career, my, my house, uh, my, you know, all this, uh, all this. I want to know the knowledge of his will for my life. But this doesn't say, Paul's not praying that they would have a knowledge of his will for their life, but rather that they would have a knowledge of his will. This is a much bigger picture. 
to understand the will of God. And, and again, we're so narcissistic, we want to put it all down to ourselves. What is, we immediately see ourselves in here, don't we? What is the will of God for me at, at this weekend? I'm a pastor, you know, what's, what's God's will that I preach on this weekend? What's God's will that, uh, for us to do as a, as a church this summer? What's God's will for uh, this ministry and the directions we go? All those things, I'd love to know them and it would be uh, wonderful. But this isn't about that. This is the knowledge of his will. Boom. There it is, the whole thing. I think it's a very uh, much a, uh, a bigger picture that uh, you get here to know here's what God's up to. Now, in a real sense, this is having a biblical worldview. If you have a knowledge of God's will, you have a biblical worldview. You know what's going to happen out there in the future because it is the will of God. In fact, why do I support Israel? Because I know the knowledge of his will. I know the knowledge of his will because I have a knowledge of the Bible. I've read the Bible. I d discerned that, interpreted that into a knowledge of his will. Prayerfully, I've done it with wisdom and spiritual understanding. So I'm able to know his will in terms of Israel, his will for the future, his will even as it was played out in the past. This knowledge of his will is what we really need to have. Now, uh, let me show you a, a little uh, slide that I've come up with that uh, hopefully will be helpful here on how to come to a knowledge of his will. Notice, not a knowledge of his will for your life, but a knowledge of his will. What is the overall plan of God? What is God up to? That is his will. Here's what it takes to have a knowledge of his will. First of all, you're going to have to have a knowledge of the Bible. I've got three ingredients here that you're going to have to have. You're going to have to have a knowledge of, a Bi of the Bible. Let me just say uh, really uh, uh, plainly that if you do not have a, uh, a knowledge of the Bible, you, you have no clue what the Bible says other than a few verses maybe you picked out of context. If you don't have a knowledge of the Bible, you don't have a clue what the will of God is. You, this is foundational, is a knowledge of the Bible. But with a knowledge of the Bible then, you have to come in this second ingredient, and that is that you've got a commitment to read the scripture literally without preconceived bias, without preconceived notion. This is very hard, by the way. We, we uh, come in, as uh, earlier I was teaching on the book uh, on, on uh, Noah, and our preconceived notion is that Noah was given a good Southern Baptist sermon inviting everybody to come in, and he was closing it with a hymn of invitation, just as I am without one plea, but unfortunately no one ever came. That's our preconceived notion. That, my friend, does not come from Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, or 9, nor does it come from the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I could go all the way through to the book of Revelation, and it's not there. But we thought that because we have a preconceived bias or a preconceived notion. Much of it come through uh, uh, covenant theology. Uh, but come emptying your mind of that and say, what does the Bible say? So I'm going to read it literally. And reading it literally then, I've got three principles to help you to carry out this uh, foundational principle. First of all, words will be interpreted using the Bible as its own dictionary. This is really the way that I study. When I uh, uh, use uh, my Logos Bible software here, I will uh, come along, for example, and uh, uh, take a word uh, like knowledge right here, and uh, I will uh, just uh, check it out, and here it is, epigenosis is the word, and there's the Greek Strong's number, and I'm going to uh, look up every time the uh, word is used in, uh, in, in the uh, in King James Version here. I've got 20 times. I can study this word epigenosis. I can learn what epigenosis is about by the study of this word. Be careful, in, when you're studying, by the way, not to just come and say, well, knowledge. Uh, you know, one thing I can do is double click right here and I'll get a dictionary definition of knowledge. And uh, this one uh, happens to have a, a, a little bit of a, a, a biblical uh, slant to it. But this tells me what knowledge is. It doesn't tell me what epigenosis is. And so I have to be careful not to come into the, uh, the, the, the works of man uh, to uh, discover these things. So. 
uh, we, we want to come and say words are interpreted using the Bible as its own dictionary. Again, this right here is really where I spend so much of my time. This is where I learn what the Bible says because I do all that cross-reference check. It takes a long time. So people don't want to do this. Who wants to read 20 passages on knowledge just to find out what, he, what Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 means? And yet, that's the kind of work you have to do. So... I'm going to read it literally. I'm going to interpret words using the Bible as its own dictionary. I'm going to come with another preconceived bias, and that is words do not have multiple meanings unless multiple meanings are in the Bible. Now, this will spare you from saying, well, what he meant is. Uh, and because we come into uh, uh, passages like, uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. And we'll say, well, what he meant is seek first the, uh, the, the rule and the reign of Christ in your heart. But that's not what it says. It says, seek the kingdom of God. And you could go and you can find what kingdom of God is all through the Bible. And it's never the rule and reign of God in your heart. It's always the uh, future kingdom. So words don't have multiple meanings unless you can find them in a Bible uh, using the Bible as its own dictionary. Then the third preconceived bias is words mean what the author intended them to mean. That is, they don't mean what I want them to mean or what I intend them to mean. Uh, you know, many times a preacher will come and he'll stand before his congregation and say, Now, would you turn in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18? And it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. And then he begins to get into a sermon. Now, now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to have a vision. And God has given me a vision. I've got a vision for this place. And it involves a new building. Uh, first of all, give your millions right here. And it involves an airplane for the pastor. And it involves a hot tub, too, in the pastor's office suite. This is my vision that I have got. Where there's no vision, the people perish. That's why we've been languishing around here like a fish out of water, because we don't have a vision. But now I've got a vision, and life is going to come. Now, you know what that is? That is making the words mean what I intend for them to mean. Because that's not what vision is talking about at all. Actually, in that passage, it says, if you'll let the Bible interpret itself, what the author intended to mean is, where there is no revelation from God, the people perish. That is, when there's a famine for the word of God, the people are going to perish. I have to go with what the author meant, not what I mean. So, you want to come to a knowledge of his will? Have a knowledge of the Bible. Read it literally without any preconceived uh, bias other than these three things. And then have a stubborn refusal to skip over a passage or restate it to have a different meaning. Some of this I mentioned right here uh, in the restating. But if you come along and say, I am not going to skip a verse. I'm not going to skip a passage. Because often it's in those hard ones that don't go with what we're trying to say. They, they, they don't go with, uh, with our preconceived notions. We jump over that verse. We skip it. You want to check this out? Pick up a commentary. You'll very, very, very rarely find a commentary that speaks on the hard verses because the hard verses don't go with our preconceived notions. And so they skip over that kind of thing. This is why I try in these Bible studies to, to take it word by word, verse by verse, and not skip over uh, things. Uh, uh, I, I suppose if I did it uh, completely, then we would still be in the book of Revelation, wouldn't we? But uh, we have uh, this, this word to be filled with the knowledge of his will. Here is the really what I think is the three-step basis. If you will come to a knowledge of the Bible, reading it literally, not skipping over a passage or restating it, guess what you're going to end up with? You're going to end up with a knowledge of his will. I think this is what the church is lacking today, by the way. They don't have a clue what God is up to. And uh, so... They're trying to build the kingdom and a number of other things that just uh, don't make sense if you have a, a knowledge of his will. Now, let's uh, look at verse 10, which is the result of the knowledge of his will. He says, I want you to have the knowledge of his will. Why? That ye might walk worthy unto the Lord, unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. I just want to stop right here at the, uh, the, the first part of this. The, the, the outcome or the result of having a knowledge of his will 
is it enables us then to walk worthy of the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me, unto all pleasing. So, uh, Paul, interestingly, he's not praying. He doesn't say, I pray that you would walk worthy unto the Lord. This is what a, a preacher does, is jump straight to the application. But he says, no, there's a foundation. That's a knowledge of his will. How can you walk worthy if you don't have a clue what uh, God is up to? I uh, am reminded of an old illustration about a, a fellow who is uh, moving some things. I happen to be down here uh, in our basement studio, which uh, doubles up as a storage room. And uh, uh, lots of boxes over here. And uh, just imagine I'm uh, uh, Jeremiah and I, we decide, uh, you know, I'm, I'm moving something. Jeremiah comes in and says, hey, can I help you? And so, yeah, I'm having a hard time. And so uh, we're pushing and pulling and trying to get it through the door and can't, can't, can't get it through. And I, uh, I, 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 I finally get frustrated and he says, you know what, I don't think we're ever going to get it out of here. And I say, get it out, we're trying to get it in. You see, now, if, if he doesn't have a knowledge of my will, which direction are we going? We're going to be working against ourselves. So we come here, Paul prays we'd have a knowledge of his will. I, I, I think it is so important that preachers and Bible teachers teach, uh, teach the Bible chronologically. What is the message of the Bible? And when you know that, then you might walk worthy, uh, walk, walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Without that, you're just making a guess. And this is what preachers do is they tell you how to walk worthy without ever having a knowledge of his will. And many times I think them not even having a knowledge of his will. So uh, we are going to uh, do this uh, particular work here in order to walk, wor <laughs> walk worthy of the Lord. Now, uh, how do we know if we're walking worthy of the Lord? Well, the way you know is that God blesses you with material wealth and prosperity. And of course, if you're walking worthy of the Lord, you're going to be blessed in this way. Obviously, uh, I am, uh, uh, I started to say speaking tongue-in-cheek. That's not even tongue-in-cheek. I'm just totally lying. I'm making up stuff there. That is what a lot of the world would have us to believe, but these are not the signs of walking worthy. If I want to measure my life and say, I'm supposed to have a knowledge of his will that leads into a worthy walk, am I doing that? There's a fourfold expression of a worthy walk that is given beginning in uh, verse 10 and going down through uh, verse, verse, uh, verse 12. And uh, here is uh, evidence number one is being fruitful. Being fruitful in every good work. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the scripture says, um, excuse uh, me, let me uh, make a... Uh, a bookmark there so I can come back to it. But I want to show you uh, uh, Titus chapter 3 verse uh, 14. And it says, uh, uh, Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. Now, we're hoping to be fruitful. And he says, let us learn to maintain good works to be fruitful. Now, when you put that uh, together, uh, what you see is that if we're going to be fruitful, a walking worthy means we're going to be fruitful, we have to, according to Titus 3.14, maintain some good works. So we gain a knowledge. That knowledge says, you know, here's the kind of things that I ought to do, that I ought to carry out. And that work then produces a fruit. I, I think that uh, we, we can't take this as an internal fruit or a spiritual kind of fruit. Uh, the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding, those would be spiritual kinds of fruit. But he's saying that there's got to be some results of it. Uh, that's an evidence of a worthy walk. And uh, I, so we begin to walk. We know what he, he is doing. And so we begin to do these. We maintain good works. Uh, you notice he says, being fruitful in what? Every good work. So Titus talks about maintaining good works so you're not unfruitful. Uh, uh, Paul uh, talks about, or Paul to Titus, and here Paul to Colossae says, you better be fruitful in every good work. 
And uh, so this is being carried out, this uh, fruitfulness that comes through good works. Now, you can uh, consider your own life there as you consider these evidences of a worthy walk. And again, you don't want to be the one who is so fi filled with knowledge <clears throat> and even uh, perhaps uh, wisdom and spiritual understanding, but you're never putting it to, to, to work. I mean, uh, get, a, get a job working in the nursery or something at church. Uh, find some means of being fruitful in every good work. Uh, be a, a missionary. Be a witness in your community. Whatever it is. Uh, and uh, be fruitful in every good work. That's evidence number one. Now, evidence number two is also in verse 10. And it uh, says that not only are we fruitful in every good work, but increasing in the knowledge of God. Uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this, this particular uh, issue here of increasing in the knowledge of God, I think, is not really a high priority in the church today. There is uh, not a great interest in increasing in the knowledge of God. Again, we want to increase in uh, wealth and health and prosperity. We want to increase in uh, uh, leadership abilities. If you want to learn as a pastor, if you want to learn uh, leadership, there are podcasts and websites and conferences a dime a dozen out there. You can learn leadership all day long as a pastor. But you, you, you call pastors together and say, hey, we're going to try to increase in the knowledge of God. Nah, I did that in seminary. I know all that kind of stuff. Uh, what I need to know is how to break the 200 barrier. And, and, and the, the, the church has just bought into this, these ridiculous uh, ideas when there's just not an increase of the knowledge of God and of his will. Pastor uh, uh, Alan Ray, who's on uh, online with us right now, sent me something just this morning, actually, a survey of pastors about uh, eschatology in times. And what it, what, what, I, what it was very clear to see is that pastors are all over the map on it. You know why they're all over the map? Because they don't know the Bible, they don't have a knowledge of his will, and they don't know God. And uh, they, they know leadership, they know how to take surveys. They know how to publish stuff. On and on it goes. But they don't have a knowledge of God. This is what you and I ought to be increased in. Now, how do you gain a knowledge of God? Can I tell you uh, uh, one of the uh, most uh, ridiculous things that I was ever forced to do? And uh, that is that I was uh, working on a doctor of ministry at Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. And... Uh, we, uh, you know, had been through college, had a three-year master's degree, now working on a doctorate, and uh, out there sitting there in the classroom with uh, people who are supposed to be smart and all this kind of stuff. And the, uh, the, they, they uh, caused us to take a three-day period. And these classes were from eight in the morning till five or six in the afternoon. And one day we talked about what we were going to do uh, in this three-day period. We talked about it. The second day we did it. The third day we came and talked about what we had done. Three days out of a 10-day seminar. Uh, and what I was supposed to do that middle day is go somewhere and be silent. That was the assignment. Go somewhere and be silent. Don't take your Bible, they said. You could take a, uh, some paper and a pen, just be out there, be silent. You're not supposed to talk all day. I mean, they, they went into this so, so strongly about not supposed to talk. You're just supposed to sit there and be silent and see what God has to say for you. Now, the only thing I figured out that, that uh, God revealed to me is that is stupid. That is absolutely stupid. Why not come together and get a knowledge of God? How am I going to get a knowledge of God? I tell you, he revealed himself in his word. This is one of the reasons, for example, why uh, that heretical book called The Shack was so popular. Uh, it's a dilapidated theology. Don't get it. And I, I understand a movie's coming out uh, this uh, later on this year. And uh, if if your church promotes it or your denomination promotes it, I just say it's time to get out. Time to go somewhere else. Because here it is saying, well, it's so comforting to see God as a, you know a, 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 a big African American woman cooking biscuits in the kitchen. Well, that might be comforting, but it's not God. 
And uh, there is, is somebody's imagination of a fake deity. We're to come to a knowledge of God. By the way, shame on the bookstores who sell that garbage, and they, uh, they do it unashamedly. I worked very hard to get the Lifeway Christian bookstores to get it off their shelves, but they didn't want to. You know why? Cha-ching, cha-ching. That's why. It sold a fake, false God, and they didn't care about it. Now, we ought to come to a, 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 a knowledge of God. That is an evidence of walking worthy. If we come more and more to understand what God is like, we have this evidence of Him, uh, this uh, knowledge of Him. Now, there is a, a third uh, bit of evidence, and that uh, is here in uh, verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. Now, some things happened here in uh, English that I want you to, uh, to, to notice. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, these uh, other two evidences of walking worthy. One is being fruitful and increasing. Now, you notice ing, ing. That's a participle. That means it's an ongoing activity. So if you're walking worthy, you're being fruitful. Not that you were fruitful once or you're going to be fruitful out there. You're being fruitful. You're increasing. You didn't gain it all and finish when you graduated from that silly seminary, but you are still increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, in English, English, it's, it uh, s switches over here, and it doesn't, it doesn't carry forth the participle, but it is a participle. So it really should be like being fruitful. It should, should say being strengthened with all his might. I, uh, uh, let's take a look at uh, the Greek over here, and uh, you see it is bringing forth fruit, growing in the knowledge, being strengthened according to the might of his glory. Now, uh, these, uh, someday I'm going to teach you how to use this Greek too, by the way, uh, these, these, uh, the, because it happens to be a uh, uh, bright orange here, and, uh, and uh, that this tells me that this is the subject. Uh, so we've got uh, bringing forth fruit to walk, growing to walk. Uh, being strengthened to walk. These are results here, and there are four of these boxes that help me realize there's four evidences uh, here as uh, we study Greek. But being strengthened with all his might. Uh, and we are strengthened then uh, according to his glorious power, or literally according to the power of his glory. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, there, there's a result then of uh, being uh, strengthened. Let me move in here in the Greek. Uh, being strengthened according to the might of his glory, uh, the glory of him, uh, to all endurance and long-suffering with joy. Now, catch this. Being strengthened according to the might unto endurance and suffering. Now, that is the strength has a result itself. And that is because we're, in, we're strengthened uh, according to his glorious power, we're strengthened for what? We're strengthened just to be strong? No, we're strengthened for patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. This is the purpose of being strengthened with all might according to his power. Now, there are uh, uh, some people, uh, you can go to a, uh, a, a gym, a workout facility sometime, and you'll find some fellows there who are being strengthened for the purpose of being strengthened. They never actually lift it. Uh, so, I am uh, not exactly sure where we uh, cut off, but uh, the, the point, as I was uh, saying just a moment ago, he's translated us into the kingdom. I think that's a future reality that he's speaking of, of course, in solid terms. Uh, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. Well, uh, the, the power of darkness being death, as we see in uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 53, are we really delivered from death? No, we're not. You get out and play on the railroad track and the train comes, you're going to find that you're delivered unto death, not delivered from death. And this is the power of darkness. So this is not something that's happened today. So when someone comes, yeah, we're living in the kingdom. See, we've been delivered from the power of darkness. Then go through scripture and say, let me show what the power of darkness is. It's death. Now then ask them, do you believe we're delivered from the power of death? I mean, physical death. And if so, uh, you know, uh, challenge them to, uh, uh, to, to, to a fight or something, I guess. Uh, 
a, a gunslinging draw and uh, see what comes out because they're going to say, no, certainly I haven't been delivered from the power of death. That's going to be later, the power of darkness. Well, I would agree. It is going to be uh, later. Now, we are then, tra he translated us uh, into the kingdom of his dear son. Uh, let's uh, look into uh, the Greek right here. Uh, and uh, the, the, the word ice, into, uh, it, it really, uh, you have the question, is it into or unto? Uh, in, in a sense, we have been translated unto the kingdom, but we haven't been translated into the kingdom because we're not in the kingdom yet. But uh, we, we have our standing there because we have a, we're, we're partakers. We have our share, this uh, portion. Now, uh, I think that in the end, what you have to do is say, I'll tell you, we're in the kingdom of his dear son when we've been delivered from the power of darkness. This is something that is sure to take place because God is true to his word and he has made us uh, meet to be partakers of the inheritance. And I'm so glad about that because uh, I couldn't at all become qualified to be a partaker in my own. For one, I'm not Jewish and there's nothing I could do to become Jewish. But he made us qualified to have a share of the inheritance. He delivered us. Now really notice this is two things, giving thanks to God. He's made us partakers. He has delivered us, uh, translated us from the power of darkness unto the kingdom of his uh, dear son. Well, uh, I uh, do want to thank you for joining us uh, today. Again, sorry that we don't have a live broadcast, but uh, rather have uh, this early broadcast. Many of you will be watching, <laughs> watching it at the uh, regular time, and uh, I uh, miss being with you individually. Personally, I will be back next Thursday night live at our normal 8 p.m. time. I hope you will uh, go to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, allergy season. I hope that you'll go to our website, randywhiteministries.org. Got a new uh, article up there uh, about baptism. And uh, check that out along with all the uh, resources, many more resources, audio and visual resources we're working on uh, putting up and should have those done uh, very soon. And then I hope that also You'll go to dispensationalpublishing.com. I've got an article up, up there today about uh, understanding the uh, dispensations. Well, thank you for being with us as a part of our Bible study. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that uh, you have given us the opportunity to have Bible study in uh, this book of Colossians. Um, and uh, thank you for the knowledge of his will that when we have it, we're able to make good decisions about our own lives but even more than that, we are able to understand what God's up to and where, is he, where he's going. We're grateful for this in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, thank you for being here with us. Jeremiah Sutton on our controls today. And uh, God bless each one of you until our Sunday broadcast, if you can join us. Class is dismissed. <laughs>